<laughs> Hello. Hello. Welcome to Try Girl Summer. Hey, Corey. How goes Hi, Natasha. It? How goes it? It goes well. How are you and Liam? Uh, we're hanging in there. Uh, so welcome to Track Girl Summer. I'm your co-host, Natasha Hastings, joined by my additional co-host, Liam. He's home from school, uh, not feeling too well. Um, and my co-host, the Corey Carter. And we are bringing the culture to track and field. Track Girl Summer. Track Girl Summer. Uh, follow me, Natasha Hastings, Instagram, IG. Instagram is IG. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Follow Corey, the Corey Monster. Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, IG. Why do I keep saying IG and Instagram? Most importantly, yeah. follow Track Girl Summer, trackgirlsummer.com, trackgirlsummer.com. Uh, Instagram and Twitter and our YouTube channel. If you're watching, you should be watching from our Track Girl Summer YouTube channel. Uh, we've been streaming live every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but stay tuned for some changes to come. But for now, meet us here every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So today, we are going to get into the shenanigans as usual. Um, we have a special guest, the Edric Floriel, uh, Corey's coach, probably second favorite person to Ajay in the world. <laughs> but we will be joined by uh, Coach Floriel in a little bit. So, uh -oh, excuse you, excuse you. Uh-oh, you all right? All right. So, we'll start off with a fit check, right? First segment is our fit check. Yeah. Um, today I finally got I finally got my Track Girl Summer merch. Um, if you ordered a Track Girl Summer shirt, it's out in the mail, so you should have yours soon. Um, it flows on today, so I don't know if you guys can see, but I have my oh, that's the wrong way. The flows my flow of snows pin, and then just some like I like call this like like a Ninja Warrior pants from Jordan, so. And Kovu is not here for the fit check, guys. Um, he's also, uh, you know, well, he's feeling fine. He just needs to get his, like, shots. So he's at the vet. Mm, okay. Well, so, I well, am matching today with my Track Girl Summer t-shirt on. <laughs> Look at Liam with his plaits. I freshly braided his hair because today was picture day at school, but obviously now we're going to have to make up for it. Um, I'm just going to show the t-shirt the because it's one of them days working from home, mom life. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that is that. Track Girl Summer merch available at trackgirlsummer.com. We also have trucker hats. Don't forget the hats. And like Corey said, you actually, you should have your um, shipments by now. Right? Yes. Um, we're also going to continue the fit check because... Track was showing out at the Met Gala. Yes. We so, were. yes, we were. I just felt like we had to highlight it on Track Girl Summer. Um, first up, <laughs> the queen in the ostrich. She didn't have to do it, but she did. I think 150,000 ostrich feathers. I saw this. I, I had to hit up Allison and I, and I told her, I said, sometimes people in your life leave you because they can't go where you're going. And I said, this is where our friendship ends because I'm not at that level yet. I'm not in that phase of my journey yet. And I know I have to let you go and prosper. So. She did this. Uh, Allison is rocking Fendi, 250,000 ostrich feathers. She had to get to the Met Gala in a sprinter standing up. <laughs> and of course, her brother, Wes Felix, was there to help carry the dress and get her dressed and all the things. Always ever so supportive. Um, yes, it is giving regal. When I saw this, I was like, uh, edges snatched. Come through. Good. 
Uh, so Allison wasn't the only one that showed up and showed out at the Met Gala. Hold on, let me. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm juggling too many things right now, but let me get it. Let me get our next one up. Carrie, she said she um, wanted to feel like a phoenix rising from the ashes mm -hmm. with the red for the fire on top. Um, I kind of like how the course it gives you like, I still have abs, don't forget. <laughs> and she said she looked like Cinderella. So she stepped out in the red and black, um, looked very good. The hair was sleek. Mm -hmm. I liked it. It's a lot, but it's not a lot. You know, and I liked that um, to me, the outfit fits like her edgy spiciness, you know, so I was like, this is perfect for her. What I also thought was cool was, um, you know, in 2020, we've been seeing a lot of performative BLM support, um, but we really didn't see too many, if any, black designers at the Met Gala. Um, so I don't remember who um, this designer was, but I do know that the person who bought the table that Shakira was invited to sit at um, is a black designer and was representing for the black designers at the Met Gala. So shout out to Shakira for um, being that representative for black designers at the Met Gala. Yes, and Liam, Liam, Liam is here for the shenanigans today. Last but not least, <laughs> Come on, Reverend Noah Lyles. Reverend Noah Lyles was in the building as well. Track and field showed up and showed out at Met Gala. I'm I'm not mad at it at all. I was I was happy to see us represented. Um, and for some on the track news, um, just I'm gonna do a quick, quick little Z Zagreb rundown. Shout out to Devon Allen for running his first sub 13 performance. He won um with 12.99. Um. And Francine Yosaba <laughs> ran the world record in the 2K. Um, Casey Lightfoot uh, broke the meet record in the pole vault. Karani also broke the meet, meet record in the 400. And Ryan Krauser finished out his undefeated season. So Ryan, so Ryan. Ryan. I went through it quick because Natasha says I have to stay on time today. So I, um, I gave her a good talking before we got on. <laughs> and now we'll just since he came on early, we'll bring on our guest, my coach, Edric Floriel. He is a two-time Olympian for Canada. Even though did you know did you know my reputation, Natasha? I didn't know that. And I didn't know that he was um Team Canada until this year, honestly. Yes. Um he has a bronze medal in the nineteen ninety Commonwealth Games. Uh -oh. The triple in outdoors. Um, he went to Arkansas. What's wrong? You're skipping a little bit. So we lost you a little bit. Start start over from his Commonwealth um, accolades. We need to make sure that uh, we get all the correct accolades. Okay. Sorry. He is the Canadian record holder for the triple indoor and out. Um, he went to Arkansas where he won. Um, Triple jump indoors. Uh, sorry, he won NCAAs for the triple jump indoors in 1989 and 1990, and he won the outdoor championships in 1988, 1989, and 1990. Of uh, countless champions, Olympians, record, he has a record holder, countless champions, uh, and he's been a coach for over. Over 25 years, I know Liam's very excited, um, and right, and he is currently the head coach of the University of Texas. He is the only person in my life that has bigger goals and aspirations for me than myself, and he just loves all his athletes way too much to let them fail. So, without further ado, Coach Flo. <laughs> Welcome, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Sorry for my unprofessional son in the background, but you know, we got to do what we got to do here. <laughs> no problemo. He's probably going to um, apologize for his unprofessional daughter. Um. <laughs> but hi, Coach Lo. Thank you for coming to Track Girl Summer. This no cool. problem, Track Girl Summer. Thanks for having me. You know, Coach Lo don't really be out here in these streets doing interviews, shows. 
you know, we're in for a real treat today. Um, first things first, how did you start coaching? Oh, coaching way back when at Georgia Tech, I believe, was my first coaching college coaching opportunity. It was just so I can use the track. I agreed to coach the team so I could use the facility. And uh, that's how I started coaching, just as a necessity to have a place to train as a professional, uh, Lavana and I. Okay, okay. And, you know, the, the pin, the hashtag is flow knows. You coach the jumps, the sprints, the hurdles. I've seen you put mid-distance athletes through workouts. I've seen you train some long distance runners. Um, I feel like you probably helped Tony out with the whole walk. You know it all. How did you become so skilled at coaching all these different events? And I also like to for you to explain how you, how the phrase uh, coach flow came about or flow knows came about. Oh, uh, there was, uh, geez, that was back in Lexington, Kentucky. The gentleman, I think his name is Jake Mose. Um, when I took the job at Kentucky, it was not the, I guess, the mecca of track and field. So in need of some, I don't know, some publicity uh, and the fact that I coached so many events in one way, shape or form, I, I coached the pole vault, the multis, uh, even the 15 at some point. So... Uh, Jake came up with the flow nose, just the, the vast number of events that I coach, um, similar to Flojo and Bonos. That was his, I guess, his, his great uh, 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 mindset at that point. So we sort of went along with it and it helped sort of build a little bit of uh, identity to Kentucky. Um, how do I coach so many events? I don't know. I'm just nerdy by nature. Um, not naughty, but nerdy by nature. I uh, just <laughs> like to solve problems and solve issues. You know, coaching is just resolving issues, try to figure it out. And, and I'm always trying to figure something out one way, shape, or form. And when you say you're nerdy, oh. sorry. Go ahead, Corey. Like, I'll ask when after you. And you say you're nerdy. What was your major in college again? I majored in just about everything, but my passion was <laughs> physics. <laughs> So that was going to be my question because most times great athletes don't turn out to be great coaches. And you're not only a great coach, but you're a great coach of many vast <laughs> um, number of events. So, I mean, you're obviously a student of the sport, but then now learning that you were a physics major, you're, you're a student. So I guess you kind of answered the question that I was going to ask of like, how you made that transition. How did you even manage coaching, but also training yourself at the same time and, you know, making that transition, which a lot of professional athletes struggle with how to make that transition after their career. Well, just being a workaholic, I, uh, I got a lot of passion. Actually, I don't have many. I have one, just get to work and stay there as long as possible. Um, so outside of work and, family, that's about the length of my day. I don't really do anything outside of that. Um, and I never intended to be a coach. My passion was uh, electrical engineering. Actually, I almost got electrocuted when I was a kid, trying to take a radio apart and put it back together and plugged it back in and it didn't really work out. So I thought that maybe I should learn that business. So I, I wanted to do that. And if you're a double E major, you understand that Athletics does not really fit in. The projects, the group project does not work at all. So I had to sort of get away from that. And physics just made sense to me. But even that became difficult and try to juggle success athletically and success academically. I think it's difficult for all athletes to just try to balance two passions. And athletics, track and field is extremely selfish. You either give it all you got or it's going to rip you apart. So I had to make some tough decision, but my passion was just physics and double E. I, I, coaching was not something I ever even thought about until I started coaching at Georgia Tech and one thing led to another. Still doing it. And the physics and the double E really comes in handy when you're talking about science of movement and, and at track and field is all, all physics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you said, you know, you had your you loved electrical engineering, but you had to really commit to athletics because 
you know, you got five NCAA championships under your belt. I don't know how many times you won conference. Um, what was your mindset when you were in the trenches as an athlete? Like, I, I've heard it many times what you thought about when you were training, but how did you approach it when you were an athlete yourself? Um, I just, I just enjoy getting better. I wasn't the fastest. I wasn't the strongest, but I certainly outworked everybody else. That was my, my mindset. And I just believe that, that you can take your body to whatever you decide to. It's just, body is just a tool. The brain decide how far I could ignore pain. Like nobody else. I could be down at the end of a workout and just shut that part of my brain off and just focus on finishing the workout. So I was just sort of a workaholic as an athlete and kept doing it as a coach, just I'll do everybody else by sheer work. I, I probably shouldn't have won that many championships, but I could get in people's head, number one. And number two, I can just figure out what to do to get better than they did. I, I just, I just out hustle them. Yeah. Rachel Hampton dropped a, a gem there. Cause, cause that was a gem. My brain just didn't go. I, I couldn't say it verbatim how you said it, but your brain could go a place that your body <laughs> might not necessarily be ready to go, but you're going to take it there, man. And you said you got, you were able to get another athlete's heads, but you would always tell me one of the training tools you used to have is you used to imagine your top competitors sitting in the stands while you would uh, train. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. One of my things I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't bend over to throw up. So if I had to throw up, it had to go in my shirt. I just believe that that bending down was not acceptable. So I probably pushed my body way too far uh, most of the time and get some pretty good nasty injuries out of it. Um, but I just believe in just mental toughness. Still do. I just think that uh, nowadays we look at sort of mental toughness and struggling and, and things like that. I, I, you know, it's all wrapped into sort of, you know, mental health and, and we probably come from a little different generation with most of that stuff we just dealt with. Um, and, you know, the pressure, you know, going through the NCAA, I think I won three. I was the first guy that won three NCAA championships in a row. And I remember the third one, I had butterfly, goosebumps, you name it. And I think now we're, we take those feelings, this uneasiness, uh, nervousness, jitterness, you know, you got to go pee every five seconds as in there must be something wrong with you. That's just, uh, that's just come with, chasing the dream and having the pressure and the requirement and having people expecting you to do well. I think that's the tough thing. When people expect people to do well, mm -hmm. then things take a different road. You know, you just expect to do the well, you just take a deep breath and go do it. And you know, like Michael Jordan was just say in the zone, you know, you go from a place where you're deathly afraid and frightened to a place where things get really quiet and you don't really hear anything else. And all you're doing is almost like, it's, it's like, shh. Yeah. You get in that little alley and everything is quiet and everything is calm and you don't know how, but you know, there's nothing your competitors can do on that day to beat you. And if that, if it takes a world record, man, so be it. And you know, you're not going to beat me today. I'm just not going to let you. And I have no idea what I'm going to do, but I know whatever you do, I'm going to do better. And then we have these days where it's just impossible to beat us. And, and, and we handle the stressors that comes with competition and handle it. And I guess maybe it was mental health and we just didn't know it, but we just were told this is what comes with the game. Yeah. I Man, that was just <laughs> like, literally, we talk sometimes about like the pressure that builds up before you get on the line. And then it's like the gun goes off and it's like literally like what you said, Michael Jordan said, where it's like it goes silent and you you know what you're doing, but you don't really know what you're doing. You don't know what's going to happen, but you're in it's it's fight or flight, you know, and it's either you rise to the occasion or not. So I'm curious to hear about like your um, mental toughness, but then again, continuing to pull out some things out of individuals again in a vast number of events. Like I think one of the things that makes a great coach is not someone that can write workouts, right? Anybody can do that, but being able to coach different athletes that need different things physically and mentally. And I think over the years, you've definitely shown that you have <laughs> the capability and the success to do that. So I'm just curious. I'm, I'm really curious to hear about that transition from, you know, being able to speak from your own experiences into your athletes, but then also keying into what those individual athletes need. 
Yeah, see, my coaching philosophy goes sort of backwards. I, I, I try to imagine, close my eyes and imagine the athlete at their very best. Yeah. And then I try to work backwards to sort of the pieces that, that are missing and try to get to that, that point. Um, so, for example, every year we have a different focus for, for any athlete. So one year we might work on that, and the next year we work on something else. So every year is sort of, I don't know, building a, a brick house, you get layers on layers on layers. But, but, but the, the idea of doing the same workout every year and hoping for it to get better, that old adage really doesn't work. Now, each athlete has things missing, and, and, and I, I call it sort of like a IKEA, IKEA generation. It's like you buy something from Ikea, it's guaranteed there's going to be a couple of bolts missing, a couple of screws missing that you, you got to buy. So I look at an athlete that way and I look at my job is to, there's going to be something missing. I expect it to be missing. Then my job is to find that thing and maybe have to go back and, and get a couple more bolts and buy some glue and make some adjustment. But, but, but thinking that the role or the job of the coach is just to prepare the athlete physically with workout, that's, that's not accurate. Mm -hmm. um, some athletes don't need to be pushed physically. They just need to be pushed mentally. Some athletes need hug. In, 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 in Corey's case, lots of, lots of <laughs> I wanted hugging. to say it, but I'm glad you called it out. <laughs> lots, 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 of, <laughs> lots and lots of hugging. But, but you know, when, when you look at the athlete that's sort of being incomplete and you as a coach are sort of the puzzle maker, try to find that missing piece. And, and, and sometimes that missing piece is just watching them fail and, and teaching them to handle failure. But I think at the core of it is like learning what's missing and what the athlete need and implementing these changes. And, and sometimes figuring out when to implement what change. Mm -hmm. You go too hard too soon and it doesn't work. So some days you have to sort of accept that we're not going to do well this year, but I, I'm going to teach you some things so I can build on to it the following year. So uh, in my mind, it's just always things to figure out, like, how, how do you resolve that 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 puzzle? You know, like way back when, when Corey came back to Kentucky, she she wasn't at her, at her best. But so I had, sort of had to take on a role, I don't know, of a, 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 a monster, just, just refusing to allow her to accept or think that that there's a possibility that she couldn't be great so th there was no compromise this is what we're doing and, and you know Corey loved to talk but but there was a lot of shut up i don't i don't want to hear it and, and eventually the athletes begin to regurgitate what you're telling them and they begin to believe it and that's when the magic happened when the athlete realized that i can do this yeah. and then when they decide that they can do it then my job is to get the hell out of the way and and and, and sort of just ride along and and, and you know I, I stand I stand behind Corey I, I don't you know I'm just not the coach that's standing in the front I like to stand in the back and and let the athlete do the show I'm I'm not big on on taking pictures with with medals and whatnot that's just not my thing I, I think athletes win championships athletes are the one that have to stand behind the blocks and face their demons and deliver that mm -hmm. no matter how well I prepare the athlete. I've prepared athletes that I thought could break world records and, you know, they didn't show. I mean, we all know Kenny broke the world record 10 days after not making the Olympic team. So it, it was not a, a physical preparation. So no matter what I did to get her ready for that Olympic team, it just didn't happen because we had to deal with some other things and I had to figure out what these things are as a coach and, and fix them. If not, they're going to keep reoccurring. And, and, and hopefully, I mean, we, we are able to fix some things where she can sustain her success and, and, and it's really her success. You know, it's, it's ours because we participate, but really Kenny's the one that's competed. Corey's competed in one world championship in lane nine. I was in the bleachers. My position was about as useless as possible when the gun goes off. So I try to prepare them. So when they decide to become superstars, I've done my job so they can do their job and enjoy their success. Yeah. I agree with you, but I also disagree. Like I am on the track by myself, but I think we carry everything that you have instilled in us onto that track. And I and I know when I'm running, I'm like, I'm, most of the time, I'm like, I just don't wanna disappoint Coach Flo. And it's because you give so much to us that I'm like, my coach has done too much for me to fail. And I'm like, I yes. have to like highlight that when it comes to Coach Flo, I think there's a couple things that makes you great, in my opinion. I think one, you have vision. I think you are able to see what in you can see the possibilities and the and the greatness in athletes. And a lot of times, in cases where people wouldn't see it, like you told me, I was going to be a world champion right after I didn't make the Olympic team. You dragged Kenny 
to London after not making the Olympic team. And she, when she broke the world record, you pushed, you, you drugged Tara, <laughs> Tara along this year and told her she was going to be great. And I feel like you really instilled that to us. And I think also you talk about your work ethic. We have weights at six in the morning. Flo is there. Flo has several, he breaks up. Oh, I feel like a, it would be easy to have one big practice with all your different group, groups. You break up practice and you, you're having multiple sessions throughout the day. So you're there all day long so that you can give every single athlete the attention that they deserve. You film every single one of our reps so that we can have our film and break it down. I think you're very methodical. And all of that builds up so that when I get on the track, I'm so confident because I'm like, I say, I say it all the time. I don't mind getting my butt kicked by coach Flo because that means I won't get my butt kicked by anyone else. And I just really have to thank you for that because I feel like a lot of times, like you say, we're the ones on the podium. We're the ones with the medal, but, um, you're doing, you're doing a lot of the dirty work, um, to make I sure that a moment. So while Corey gave you your flowers there, I, I've heard Corey tell the story about London and the warm up and the moment that you knew that she was going to be the world champion. But I've heard it from Corey. We want to hear it from you because, you know, you know, Corey's real colorful <laughs> with her storytelling. Yeah. Yes, yes. So I want to hear from you. Um if, if what you can tell us about what you remember about that day, because like you said, Corey needs hugs, but the monster apparently came out that day. Mm -hmm. I, you know, to be honest, I, I, I knew she was going to win the world championships in Monaco at our training camp. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, most of the time, the, the championship portion, it happened way before then. You don't get to a championship and you just happen to win it. There are things along the way that happen that that basically lets a coach know that that person's not going to be beat. I, I already had a plan on my mind that I could afford to be five to six yards behind at hurdle number eight. And I told several, well, I just told Corey that, and I told my wife that I can be five yards behind at number eight and I'm still winning. And she said, how do you know that? Because in Monaco, we had a workout that was basically pure insanity. And but that workout was just to basically know that, okay, I can win from the front and I can win from the back and I need to know that. So that workout, I needed to know that, that Corey could win. And I knew if we can get past that workout, there's no way we were gonna lose. Um, and the workout consists of basically, I took the whole race and I broke it down in several portions. The first portion, um, she had to spike up and run the first uh, four hurdles at world record pace. Then she had to put racing flats on and run, I believe it was three 300s at world record pace for the last 300 of the 400 hurdles, without the hurdles there. And then she had to spike up again and run the last four hurdles at world record pace. And there was a moment halfway through that Corey thought, this is insane. This is not happening. I said several colorful words, maybe more than several. And Corey got back in line and spiked up. And when she crossed the line, I looked at that watch. And I got on the phone. I called the wifey. I said, I can afford to be five yards behind. There's no way I'm losing. Doesn't matter what lane we got. Then some, some shenanigans happened in London that I think probably put some spice in the chorus veins. Um, it was, uh, we had lane nine, so we had to warm up in lane nine. So I had set up hurdles in lane nine. I was ready to go. So I told Corey, get in the blocks, let's go. And I'm standing by hurdle number two to take my touchdowns. I got my watch, I'm prepared. And she is not getting in the blocks. So a few colorful words across from the track. She's not getting in the blocks and she's waving at me, waving her hand. So I walked over, there was a, large gentleman with his foot on the blocks refusing for us to use the blocks because his athlete was 70 yards away walking back and he wanted to wait for her to go again now check-in is 15 minutes away so all i remember is there was going to be some exchanges of of what they say throw hands what's that that's that what's that song uh uh try jesus <laughs> Don't try, Don't try me. Me. 
because I throw hands. So I, I had made up my mind that man, that man is gonna not be pleasant today. And then the IWF guy came by and and we were squared up and and he looked in my eyes and was like and Corey looked in my eyes like is this really gonna happen? I was like, man, I am gonna beat this man. And before I know it, he removed his foot. And like they said, the rest is history. Man. The thing is, I was worried because I was like, I know Flo's not going to have anything happen to me. And I know he's going to get these blocks from me. So it's not really a problem. I had no doubt. That's, that's my ride or die. Yes. Right there. <laughs> um, I saw a question that in the chat asking how you help Tara break the NCAA long jump rep. Record because anytime you can take a record from Flojo, you do some major work. Was it Flojo or JJK? JJK, oh, JJK, JJK, JJK. Girl. I don't know what. Sorry, my, my brain right now. <laughs> you know what I meant. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that, the, I think the process, like the, the, the weirdest thing about our sport is, is you can be mentally up or down. And, and the process of taking somebody that sort of been kicked down and lack of confidence, you know, like you talk about when you moved in to move from Kentucky, when Tara moved from, from Georgia, it just was not pretty. Um, there was a lack of confidence. I mean, she used, used to be something different and we sort of had to rebuild that. And, and that, that takes, takes some time. You can have words all day you want, but in the end, trying to get the person to physically believe that they can do it. Or Kenny going back to London, you know, but the, the thing that the challenge that I that I have, the one that I love the most is, is just try to convince people, you know, it's almost like the, the vision I have for what they can do sometime getting it through their head and, and having them look in the mirror and seeing that for themselves. It, it's it could be challenging and it doesn't always work, you know, but but I have vision and things that I see from 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 the athletes. I, I can visualize them being something greater than themselves and convincing them to do it. Sometime you can do it to work out, um, through conversation. Uh, you can have them visualize it, but but eventually one day they wake up and, and it's almost like, I believe the athletes say, you know what? I don't know if this is gonna work or not, but I'm gonna try it, try to prove you wrong. And once they sort of agree to that arrangement, then the rest is typically history. So, so to me, it's just re rebuilding her, getting that confidence back into her. And letting her know she could do it, even though some days she just didn't think she can. It's like, it doesn't matter what I said. And the athletes have to begin to work, to begin to train. And when they begin to commit themselves to the process of greatness for themselves, like the 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 the, the image in my mind, if I can get him through my skull to look through my skull to see what I see in them, that's kind of where the magic begins. When they actually open their eyes and they see, wow, I, I can actually do that. I talk about a guy named Stephen McCarter. I, the day I met him, I told him, you're going to be a... Uh, uh, you can be an Olympian one day. And he's like, my best is 25 feet, man. You're crazy. And and eventually, through some time convincing, he actually saw it for himself uh, um, and, and sort of buying Or even Jasmine Quinn, I told her she was going to be an Olympic gold medalist. And she came to me after in, uh, uh, in Tokyo. I was like, how did you know? I was like, I don't know, but I knew it. I knew from the day I met her and I knew when Corey well, walked into Lexington, I was like, we're going to win the world championship this year. And she was looking at me like, I can't even finish the workout. You know, so it, it's just a matter of just sticking to your guns and saying, I really see this and I really believe this. And I got to consistently pound it into your head until it actually happened. And, and it does work. The athlete eventually give in and say, I'm just going to try it. And when they try it, man, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And I think one of the great things is you not are only able to pull that out of, you know, gifted athletes. Um, I'm going to read a stat real quick. Um, the year before you came to Texas, the men as a team at NCAAs got 25th. Your first year um, coaching the men, they got ninth. The women, the year before you came um, at Texas was 34th. And the year at uh, after your first year, they got 10th at NCAAs. And we've seen you being able to turn Kentucky's um, track program program around. Um, and how are you able to get a whole team to, you know, buy into a new culture and really commit to, you know, we're going to go after getting some conference titles. We're going to go after trying to, you know, go after an NCAA title. How do you really get a whole team and, like, 
to buy into that. Just getting people to sort of, again, believe, visualize, and, and, and sort of engage in a process of, of just getting better. I don't say this often. Um, I Ooh, think sometimes my job- are exclusive? Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I've, I've never said this probably on anybody's camera, but I truly believe that if I can convince an athlete to quit, to physically give in and quit the sport, that athlete will never be successful. So me, who is on their side, I want them to win. I'm trying to convince them to quit. And if I fail to get them to quit, whoever they're going to compete against has hell coming. So as a coach, sometimes I think we get too caught up on trying to get somebody to keep going. That should be quitting. So my philosophy is I'm going to try to push you out of the sport. Because the people you can compete against, the Natasha Hastings, they're, they're, they're no jokes. They're going to try to take your head out. And my job is to prepare you to compete against them. So, so, so to the fall training, I'm really trying to push you to your limits. Not everybody makes it. And it's okay. This is not meant for everybody, I believe. I, I believe some people will emerge and make it, and, and they will become warriors. And they will have sort of this, this workability, this, this, this strength in competition. Uh, they will be... Uh, unbeatable because they've been just pushed to their limit and they have no limits. So through my fall training, I'm trying to decide sort of a, a friend of mine, football coach said, we're trying to figure out who can play for us on Saturday. Mm -hmm. So the whole way football is playing, they're trying to figure out because some people can play on Monday to Friday, but they're terrible on Saturday. You know, I, I remember sitting at that practice with John Calipari and there was a, a, a young man. He must have shot 33 pointers in a row. He is not missing. And, and during that time, I was working on the side with, with, with their agility with, with the Kentucky basketball player. So I'm watching this guy shoot. And I'm like, Kyle, why don't you play him? And Kyle looked at me and said, he can't make those shots when the light's on. So it, it doesn't matter how gifted you are, but can you do it when the light's are on? Can you do it on Saturday? So athletes can run great stuff in practice. But you turn the lights on at the NCAA championship. You put a little pressure, just a little bit of pressure. Your quarterback can be great in all the plays. You put some noise in, in, in the bleachers. You put some guys hating against them, yelling against the team, and they fold. So ideally, to fall training, I'm trying to get you to fold. I'm trying to figure out, can you play on Saturday? Can you line up in the Olympic Games? I mean, Kathy Freeman talked about, when she crossed the line, when she won the Olympics uh, 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 in her own country in Sydney, that, that was the toughest thing to do. Not because she can't run the 400, but because the expectations, the pressure she had to deal with, the number of people. Like, it's easy to win when it's an accident. It's hard to win when you expect it to win. When you've won the first time, the next time, they expect you to win. And that pressure really create some athletes to fail because people will be disappointed if you get second. And second in the Olympic game is pretty damn good. But <laughs> when they expect you to win and you put that pressure on yourself, you know, and internalize it, it's tough to breathe. And watching people like Carl, like both, do it over like Blojo and, and JJK, they're expected to win and they deliver. That's the tough thing. And I think you build athletes to the fall training to that mindset where when the pressure's on, you've taught them how to internalize it, take a deep breath, do like Michael Jordan, shh, and everything gets quiet and they get it done. And in the end, doesn't matter how gifted they are, if they can't do it on Saturday, if they can't do it in the Olympic final, if they can't do it in lane nine of the 400 meter hurdles, it does not matter how good of a coach you are. Well, I just got goosebumps. <laughs> well, I tell you. For a number of reasons, because talking, Corey, starting off, we're talking about buying in. That was something that we talked about Coach Fry at SC all the time, that like Coach Fry is a coach that you didn't have to be in shape, but he could talk you up in a way that you go out there and you buy what it is that he's selling. And I think that that truly is something that makes a good coach talking about like having different athletes. But man. You got to show up when the lights are on. I'm tired of having great training partners. <laughs> and then, so everything that you said, I'm like, yep, 
they make it through the fall. They pull me through the fall. And then we get to the lights come on and the roaches scatter. <laughs> and no shade, but. <laughs> <laughs> the roaches. <laughs> No shade, mm-hmm. but like literally everything that you just said, I'm like, mm-hmm, yep, you're going to break us down in the fall. Everybody's going to go through the test. Everybody's going to go through the struggle. But can you do it when the lights are on? Man, I'm sorry. I, I just had to that moment. <laughs> I literally got got goosebumps. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 you know, and it's tough to explain to, to an athlete, you know, when you line up. It is really, really tough to explain to an athlete that 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 feeling. It's almost like you look at your accomplishment. The number of time where you had that little voice tell you it ain't gonna happen today, and you're like, man, you better get back there. Better get out of here, <laughs> man. I, no, not today, mm-hmm. not today. I mean, you, or even you look at Allison. You look at that race when she made the team in the 400. At about 250, it didn't look so good. It was like, well. <laughs> This is the end for the queen. And then something happened. And it's almost like, nah, I'm just not going to let y'all take me out today. But that's something you can't coach. That's some some people just got the dog in them. You can't, you cannot coach it, but you can sort of, it's it's like athletes have to have fire. My job is not to put fire in athletes. My, My name is kerosene. My name is gasoline. I am really good at making the fire bigger. But I'm not good at being the fire. So if an athlete need for me to be the fire, they better find another coach. I, I cannot. But, Sorry, I didn't give you one of those. I had to give you that one. <laughs> that one. <laughs> you know, and, and, and Coach Fry and other great coaches. Man, sometimes if I'm not sure an athlete can do it, I will lie to my teeth. I am not sending an athlete to a competition and tell them they're going to lose. Uh, man, I'm, in, I'm a great, like, nah, we got this. Look at your training. Look at all the things you've done. And you put it together and you're like, I just need a little spark. Because if they give me a little spark, like, you know, coach, I think you're right. I douse them with gasoline. There you go. There you go. And before you know it, they walk out there in the field. They are on fuego. I, I, I walked from the warm up to the check in. By the time Corey checked into London, I'm in the infield and Robert Johnson is standing next to me. So what do you think? I was like, um, I bet my paycheck she went. He was like, really? I was like, in lane nine, dog. I was like, I bet my paycheck. And then I had the same feeling when, when Kenny was walking after checking in to London. And I looked in her eyes. I said, what's the mission? She's like, smash. And she walked away. And I thought, the eyes. all righty, all, all righty then. So, but, I'm, but I'm saying that's what a coach is supposed to do. We, we are supposed to inspire. If you got to lie. Man, lie. Do what you got to get done. Get that athlete on the end field confident and convinced that they can win. Even if they're out of shape, like when Coach Fry, his job is to send you on the field prepared to win. He can't tell you, well, let's try to get third place. No, we got this. And sometimes you're like, I hope my speech worked. But But I like the analogy that you used about kerosene, right? Because the athlete has to have the fire and you make it bigger. And in those moments that you're not in shape, but I gave you that kerosene and you go out there and you see I'm not in shape, but you also see, but Mm -hmm. I can do this if I just light that fire. Like Mm -hmm. that, that everybody ain't got that juice. That's right. Everybody got that juice. Yeah. I always. No one had me slated to win. World, except for for Coach Flo, and that was the only did tell me I could do this. I feel like did I did I pause? Yeah, yeah. Um, it was yeah. did I pause? Yeah, but go ahead. You am, am I going out? You're good now. I said no one slate had me slated to win the world championships except for coach Flo, And that was the only person I needed in my life to believe in me. That was the only per that was the only opinion that I cared about because that's the only person going through the struggle with me every day, but fight, <laughs> fighting with me and against me sometimes. But, and, mm-hmm. and that was all I really needed. Um, and you talked about, you need athletes with fire. I think, you know, you've been at top track programs. You've been a head coach. I think people would love to hear what you look for when recruiting athletes. Um, who, who are you trying to, like, if I'm a high school athlete, how do, how do I get picked by Coach Flo? Sure. I mean, I, I think coaching is also about relationships. So you talk about when you stand behind that line and Coach Fry tells you you can win a race. Let's back up a little bit. There, there's many days of relationship building 
that allows that person to speak into your heart. If the person is never there, never there on time, is not talking to you when you're depressed, when, when your boyfriend breaks up with you, that, that relationship is built where that person's voice becomes strong. Mm -hmm. and, and you can't show up as a coach just on Saturday and speak a bunch of nonsense and think, I'm just gonna throw some kerosene and it's gonna work. Well, wait a minute. You have to be there on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday for that athlete as well. When they get dead last, you gotta be the first one to sort of talk to them. Come. And sometimes you have to not talk to them and let them suffer through that. And you have to decide when to be their coach or parent and not to be, but you have to be there. And, and I believe coaches, you have to invest in the athlete. You, you have to be connected to the athlete. You, you, you have to know their struggles and you got to be there for them when they need you. But you also have to understand when it's time not to be there to let I, 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 on this one, I'm going to let her struggle to that one. And then we'll talk about it, but you still have to be available. So you have to sort of invest and be connected to that athlete. I have a good relationship with Corey, so I know Corey. And if Corey needs something, well, she don't even have to ask. And, and I think you have to sort of do that. And so you build that relationship and through building that relationship, then your voice become powerful and the athlete trusts you. So that trust is two ways. And I also think athletes these days, not everybody run for their coach. Uh, uh, you talk about Coach Fry, it's clear that was a relationship that, that you didn't want to disappoint your coach. Uh, and likewise, I don't want to disappoint my athletes, but s s some athletes are a little selfish. They're, they're just running for themselves. They're not running for their teammates and for their coach and for their family, for their parents, for their team. And you have to be able to do some something for uh, other people. You know, so it says, uh, uh, I love my, my, my teammates because they bring out the best in me, iron, sharp, iron, iron, all this stuff. But in the end, you have to be a little bit unselfish as an athlete. Understand that my first three legs in a four by four suck but I'm the anchor leg and I'm going to pull the team through. Mm -hmm. And this is just the way it is. So, so why do I look for an athlete? So something as simple as if I'm sitting in my office, talk to an athlete and their parent, how they talk to their parent is how they're going to talk to me. Their interaction with their parent, I look at that as well. So I've had a, a young person sit there and, and mom is talking and they say, shut up mom. And right then and there, that full ride is gone. You will not run for me. You talk to her like that, you are not running for my program because I can trust you. You don't have respect for yourself. If you love yourself, you'll respect yourself and your parents. I like an athlete that doesn't do the same stuff all the time. I'm a hundred meter runner. Where you at? I, I, I pass. I like an athlete that's like coach. I'll do whatever the team needs. If I need to run the four by four, so be it. It is what it is. I like an athlete that's not defined because if, if you already define yourself, this is what I am. Well, what if I believe you're forming me? Corey is another. Corey is a good example. Corey walked to, and this is a story, true story. Corey walked to Stanford University and told me I am a hundred meter hurdler. That's what Troy said. I was both Coach Flo, and you always no, try to change no, the story. No. I Corey, so Corey believe. Me. I believe Coach Flo. Corey believed she was a hundred meter hurdler and that's what she believed. And I told her, you're going to be one of the greatest 400 meter hurdlers ever. And she was like, well, why can I just be both? I was like, but every one of us, you can do both in college, but at some point, this is sort of your destiny. You might not like that event. So if the athlete comes here and they run the one or the two, and I visualize them running 48 seconds in the 400, that means I got no shot for them to ever do that event. So ideally, as a coach, I should have the flexibility to say, I know we've been testing and this is what I see and, and, and this is what I what I kind of see you doing. And, and I'd like to experiment and sort of move that forward and try to see if we can make her into an Olympian or Olympic medalist in that event area. If the athlete is not flexible in the way we're talking to the recruiting, when it comes time for them to put him second leg, because that's the best chance for us to win. Well, I'm just an anchor leg coach. That's all I do. I anchor. Well, OK, well. I need you to run second leg today because that second leg is how we're going to win the championship. Well, no, I'm an anchor leg. That's what I do. So, and, I, and I think for me, I like an athlete that's going to be, you know, a little bit more flexible. Uh, allow, hey, coach, you know, I, I don't like to do anything. Athletes these days, they tell you, I don't like to do nothing long. Like, what? What, well, I, what do you mean don't do nothing long? I just like to do 30s, 60s, and 90s. Well, you know, we got to get on the grass and, and do some little tempo work a little bit. If the athlete is not flexible to let the coach maneuver, and adjust and change them and do their job and, and sort of find the missing pieces. Like if you're an athlete, a quarter miler, and you get run down at 350 every time and your coach wants to do some fives and you don't want to do that, well, you understand that the problem you have is going to continue the problem you have. 
And nobody wants to do no dang 500 because it hurts. That's stuff is long and it's boring. But if that's what you need to be successful, you have to sort of give the coach the ability to say, coach, here's the car, you're the driver, I sit in the passenger side, and I'm just going to ride. If you're not comfortable with that, you need to find a coach that you feel comfortable giving him the wheel. Here's the wheel. I trust you, and I know you're not going to make any decision that's going to hurt or hinder my life. And once you find that person, that's kind of what I'm looking for. An athlete that's comfortable with giving me the wheel and saying, I trust you. Now, you got to be selective. You can't just trust any old body because not every coach out there has your best interest at heart. So if you find the right coach that you can trust, you got to give up the wheel. Yes, you can have conversation, but you really don't have much of an opinion that you, you trust it. You're entrusting that person to make you into something that you can't even envision yourself doing. They have the vision and you got to trust them with the vision. Now, coaches also have to give the, this is what I foresee us doing, blah, blah, blah. And then the other have to have a good sense, you know, like me, Corey, get in the car. We, hey, I can't tell Corey, just get in the car and ride. Well, we're going to drive to California. We're going to get there by Wednesday. That's all the information you need to know. We're going to stop in Colorado, uh, uh, spend the night there and have lunch with Joe Blow and do this, do that. We're going to get there by Wednesday. And then the rest of it, you just sit there and go to sleep and trust that coach that the coach really has your best interest at heart. And the coach is going to make sure you're safe. If something was happening on the road, the coach is going to do all they can to protect you to make sure that you're safe, even before their own safety. I want to look after my athletes first because the responsibility that they've given me, man, that's a lot of pressure to know that somebody is giving you their career. Like if you screw that up, they will never be great. That's a lot of dang pressure. And you coaches have to take that seriously and really understand that I'm just going to flip a coin and see what happens. No, I agonize about workouts and touchdowns and, and splits and this. I, I sit in the office all day thinking about the grab, too much of this, too much tempo, too much of that. And if the coach agonizes over it, then it's great. The best, the best scenario, there was a Seinfeld scenario. I don't know if you guys remember. There was a show a long time ago in Seinfeld. Uh, and I won't go into the details. But basically, my vision of coaching is it's 2 o'clock in the morning. The coach is sitting behind their desk like this, and the athlete is dead asleep. That means that athlete is not concerned about getting to be a champion. That's my job. And their job is to rest and get ready for the repetition in the workout tomorrow. So the athlete shouldn't be up all night worried about, man, I need more speed work. If that's happening, that means the relationship is not completely correct. So I, I'm looking for athletes that will know that, trust me with their career, and know that I will not take their career lightly. Well, we got to make sure that we put this, uh, this is a clip that for sure has to go up because I feel like these kids these days, <laughs> and I'm raising one of these, uh, I don't know what generation my son is. However, everything counts uh, down to how you respect your family, how you respect yourself, how you show up to training, how you, yeah. do you trust the process? Um and I think these kids, we live in a, a, a microwave society now where it's, it's, yep. they want it to be overnight. And it's it's a long process. And, and like you said, I need to know that you're on the ride with me and you trust that I got this wheel. Yeah. And oh, I I think, was... Go ahead. I think it's easy to give you the keys to the car because I you have built that relationship and you've, you talked about earlier, like I trust you because I know that you're there for me. I know, I know that the decisions that you're making are always in my best interest. And that's because you invest in the time and the relationship. Um, and so it's easy to do anything that isn't going to get us to the goal. Um, granted, you know me, I got to pipe up every now and then just, just to get on your nerves. But having that trust to be like, you know what, drive the car, you're not going to crash it, we're going to get to where we're going, I can sit back and relax because my coach got has this. And I, it's because you care so much about sure. me as a human being first and then me as an athlete second. Sure. And it, I'm going to Go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> Because that what what the last thing that Corey just said there when you were talking earlier about you got to know your athlete, I kind of wanted to interrupt and say, but it sounds like you know the person before the athlete, and that's what Corey is is reiterating there that it's yeah you write the workouts you got the steering wheel but before all of that you care about me as a person and that 
that contributes to our success because if you don't care about me as a person, then you don't care about me as the athlete. Yeah, sure. and I feel like it's, the flow I get may not be necessarily the flow Kenny gets, the flow that Jenna gets, the flow that Tara gets, Tiana gets. We, hmm. you fit what we need. And I think a lot of times some coaches, we, their ego will say, well, this is how I do things. You get in line and you really say like, well, what's going to make Corey successful? Then I'll hmm. give her that. And that might be different from what's going to make Shaquille Saunders successful, you know? Sure, and I think sure. that takes a lot of humility to say, I'm here to serve and make sure you guys are good. Yeah. I mean, I, I, one, one of my pet peeves is, you know, coaches that define themselves. You know, I'm a speed and power coach. I'm a blah, blah, blah coach. And I'm a blah, blah, blah coach. And, I, you know, and, and I'm saying... You, you coach athletes. You, you don't have the right to have your own philosophy. Your philosophy must produce result to that person. So if speed and power does not help Corey be successful, I'm gonna change it. So I don't have a definition of what kind of coach I am. So so whatever the athletes need, I need to go research it, provide it, and have them be successful. So I don't really. I used to have a mindset that yeah, you know. 600 maybe now that was not my thing and i realized that i'm hurting these athletes because of these dumb philosophy of mine so i, I dump all philosophies i research the athlete and i try to figure out what they need and, and, I, and I think what, what's most important is track is what the tool you use to help somebody grow track and field is not life you, you know I, I remember kobe bryant said get over yourself you, you know you're not you're not that important and, and i listened to that interview and i was like Kobe Bryant is saying to himself, like, get over yourself. You're not that important. And, and it's true. As a coach, I got to get over myself. I, I'm not that important. I, I have a tool of track and field that I can use to help somebody grow. Sometimes I will tell an athlete it's time to retire. I'm not saying I don't believe in that athlete anymore. But I'm just not interested in watching a 26, 27-year-old person continue to have no money. And at some point, they got to build a family and retire. We also have a response to say, you know what? I believe in you. I love you, but but you're getting to the age now where you need to start investing in your future and building a family and having some money where you can retire at some point. And, and, and I'm not going to continue to watch you make twenty thousand dollars a year and suffer and live paycheck to paycheck when you got college degrees and you can really be successful earning something much bigger. And in and, and the end, track is the tool that coaches use to help people grow. It's not just about track. Track track is just futile. I mean, you turn 30 years old and all of a sudden your legs don't move so well. And all of a sudden you, you, your weightlifting ability goes down down the drain. So at some point that thing has a clock on it and it's going to end. And then, you know, you got 30 something years left of earning money to retire. You can't retire until 65. So you got 35 years left when your career is over. And as the athletes are growing their money, I'm trying to advise them that, you know, I want you guys to stop track and never to work again. That that's, that's my goal. Whatever bonuses you can hit, let's hit that. And the thing is, that's your money. I, you know, it's, all, it's almost like I'm, I'm, I'm lucky enough to make enough revenue. Oh, my light went off. To make enough revenue, not to have to charge athletes. And, and to me, it's like, if I don't want to coach you for free, I don't, I don't want to coach you. If I want to coach you because I want to make 35, 40 grand more a year, I, I'm, I'm just not interested. I, I want to coach somebody because I see something in them and, and maybe some of, somebody else don't see it. And, and, and I'm just end up with athletes that most people don't really see much in them. That person not going to be very good. And to me, that's like a big challenge. It's like, you know, like, like when Corey came, it was almost like, Man, that's it for her. She's done. So it was almost like, man, that's a challenge. Like, how, how can I fix that? Because other people don't really see and believe in, in what she can do future-wise. And I just got to figure out a way to kind of rejuvenate and revive that. That's one of the things that, that I really like. And, and I, I want to read that to you guys. The thing that Bill Walsh was my mentor at Stanford. He was the AD, interim AD at Stanford. And he has a book that he has a book, the, the, the Winning Edge, I think it's called. But he gave me a, a handwritten copy of his book uh, before it went public. To deal with adversity, you must possess the following personal attributes. An inner confidence that has been tested. You must have a level of self-assurance that has been molded by defeat, has overcome obstacle, has been shaken, has absorbed punishment, and has 
engendered a sober, steel-like toughness that result in a hardened sense of independence that will take on anything yet survive and win. I, I, like the kids these days, man, they get they get a punch in the face and they 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 they're counting to ten and they're knocked out. That, man, all you got to do is beat the clock. Now, that's the one thing I hate about a little bit about this generation, man. You punch them in the face and they're laid on the ground and you count to 10 and they're knocked out. It's okay to lose. It's okay to get punched in the face. It, it, it's okay not to make the Olympic team core and sort of reinvent yourself. That should not destroy you. You know, you know, like suicide rates going up because we're having a heart. It's okay. And I, and I think we have to get to the point where we tell kids it's okay to lose a girlfriend. It's okay for, for people in your life to walk out of your life, to drop you. That doesn't mean that's the end of your life. It just means that that's a wake-up call. Let's make some adjustment. It's okay to lose something. It's okay to, to not win a track meet. It's okay not to get a contract. You can get a contract going pro beyond, beyond college. It, it, it's okay. And it's like soon something goes wrong. They don't get something they want right away. Like we said earlier, the microwave society. If they can't put a microwave for two minutes, it's ready. They want to quit. They want to quit. Uh, it's not going to happen for me. It, it's not meant for me. It, shit. Kenny Harrison tried to win the medal a thousand times before she won the first one. And I told her, I don't do quitters. Me so <laughs> we're going to keep trying and get that thing done because that's what we do. And, and I think that's why I like what, what Bill says. Survive and win. You, you don't win automatically. You got to survive all this crap and win. You know, sick kid, you still got to get the show on. Nobody cares. Okay, your kid is sick. Boo, 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 blah, blah, blah. The show got to go on because you got a bunch of fans expecting the show to come on. People don't feel terrible for you. whoop de doo You decided to be a mom and a wife. That's your problem. We want the show. We're waiting for the show. And you got to find a way to get the show on. And if you can't, well, man, what was you? So to me, it's like, it's okay to get your butt kicked. It's okay to have a bad day. It's okay for you not to get chosen for the relay. It's okay not to make the team. But don't quit life. Don't don't quit living. Don't quit pushing. Don't quit your hope and don't quit believing because you had a bad day. I mean, it's okay. We all have those days. And what makes us great, if you think about it, I've never learned anything from winning than to raise my hand and to sing and dance. That's all I've ever heard. But from losing, I've learned the best lessons of my life from getting my butt kicked. From watching people that I coach, I believe in come short, I've had to go back and relook at my philosophy. I've learned more as a coach from not getting it done than to get it done. All I learned from breaking, from having Kenny break the world record, I learned to smoke a cigar and drink some good bourbon. I learned to give the best hug from Corey Carter when she was world champion. I mean, I, I, my hugging game was on fleek. Uh, the Olympic trial <laughs> between Kenny, Tiana, Janet, my, my, I, 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 and I'm not a hugger, but my hug game at the Olympic trials this year, man, I, I, I was an A plus hugger. I mean, I was on, I, but all you learn from winning is that five minutes of fame and enjoy it and maybe a couple of drink and a cigar and then it's done. But when you lose, you spend weeks and weeks looking at your philosophy, looking at the athlete, reevaluating the the, the, the the procedures and the training. And, and did I do too much? Did I not do enough? So to me, there's much better lessons to learn from losing and not getting it done than, than to winning. And, and, and I think these kids have to understand that every time something don't go your way, take a look at your life, make some adjustment and come back at life a little bit harder and see what happens. Oh my God. Coach Flo, I've only seen you in passings and hey, how you doing? <laughs> But I needed this, this to, I get ready to say this morning, today. I I always say that my wins are so much sweeter because of my losses, and I've had far more losses than wins. But what you just said right there is no. <laughs> it's because I've learned far more from my losses that my wins are that much sweeter. It, the, yeah. the journey and the process to get to those wins, but you're right. The win is a wave. Keep it pushing, smoke a cigar, have some whiskey. You're my kind of guy. I like both of those things. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're on to trying to achieve the next thing. But what do you yes. really learn from those wins? It's really yeah. is, it really is in the failures. <sighs> All right, Corey, I told you two o'clock. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I'm going to close it out because... 
I don't this know. is just insane. The gems. Coach Flo on all day. I just wanted to say, you know, thank you because you don't often do interviews and you came out here because, like I said, my coach always rides for me. And I can't but, believe you don't do interviews with all the gems that you drop. Well, I feel honored <laughs> that you would drop these gems on Track Girl stuff. Okay. Because I. <laughs> I'm about to go run right now. <laughs> I I just like to stay in my lane. I, I just I stay in my lane. I do my thing. I take care of my people and I move on with my life. I, I just that's just not my thing. You know, because you start talking and you become an expert. I'm not an expert in anything but but helping the people out in my life. You know, it's like I, I don't like that that idea that that I don't know any better or any more than another coach. I just I'm more passionate in it. There's a there's a quote that said uh uh um, Marcus Aurelius, I want what all men want. I just want it more. And, Everybody and wants like, the same thing. I feel like I see that every day, like the little things. Like you are the head coach of one of the most prestigious track programs in the country, yet you're not too good to pick up a hurdle. You're not too good. When COVID came, Coach Flo came every day. <laughs> we were homeless. Homeless, I say homeless because we didn't have a track and he had hurdles and cones and just a, he had a, a wagon full of stuff so we could train every day and he was lugging it back and forth out there for hours in the sun, like no no team manager help him. When the, when the storm came and, and, and in Texas and we were out of power, Flo drove around getting his athletes water and food and making sure everyone was okay. Like I'm trying to, I'm trying to close this show out and not get emotional, but I, I just really I see the, the eyes welling. I was about to say, coach, Flo, did not come and Corey didn't cry a tear. <laughs> and I'm not tired. I've gone over my limit. You guys know I cry once a year and like, I've gone over my limit so much this year. Um, but it's because I'm like, I know my coach cares about me and he puts in the work and he, and, He's so humble, just to, like serve not just me, but everyone that comes in your life. I feel is better because of you, because you are so willing to like go the extra mile to make sure people's dreams come true. And I'm so lucky that you've been in my life for so long. Uh, Let so, it go. Stop no, fighting it. No, it's just like everyone knows I ride for my coach, I die for my coach, but I hope. Today shows why, because I feel like men like you are very rare. Like a lot of coaches, I feel like use athletes and and like they do just enough and you and you do the extra mile and you make sure we're okay. And like uh, you're always going to like call no matter what. So I'm done. I'm done crying because I hate crying. I hate crying on the internet. And you really have me out here shedding tears, Coach Flo, just because. <sighs> I hate you so much, Coach Flo, but I love you so much. All right. Um, without, with that being said, but I have to look in the board and tell Coach Flo because I feel like he does not get enough credit. Um, I'm done. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> uh, so thanks, Coach Flo, for coming to Track Girl Summer. We really appreciate you. Um, uh, I see a lot of people in the comments um, wanting you to write a book, and um, I'll be I'll first in line. Mm -hmm. well, I won't even do it on Amazon. I'm going to the brick and mortar to get it. Um, and um, without further, we're going to close out the show because Tasha told me I had to stay on track today. So make sure you follow Natasha and me on the things. Coach is at Coach Flo. At Coach underscore Flow knows on Instagram. He's on Twitter. You can see the gyms. He likes like hippy dippy quotes. Um, Coach Flow loves loves a good quote. Um, and um, I have to give I have to give a little a little secret. You won't see him posting a lot of stuff of his athletes because Coach Flow is like if I post athletes when I they win, I also have to post my athletes when they lose because I'm their coach in both situations. So just another I also wanted coach. to comment on the fact that we got that Monaco workout because I know you got in trouble for posting 
turtle walks and i was like wait we're getting secrets here we're getting secrets today um, <laughs> no not, not anymore they, no not anymore i, I hey I, they can post whatever <laughs> Tar comes in, all of a sudden it's Pope, he's out here doing TikTok dances. But back in the day, the, the man I fell in love with had, had, had NDAs. Hey, hey. Uh, hey man, hey, look, I can't I cannot reach this new generation without getting getting to where they are. I've tried. They, they that's what makes you a great coach. They don't move like us. So if I don't TikTok dance and Instagram, blah, blah, the stuff that I'm really not good at, if I don't do it, I can't touch them and reach them and kind of get into their life. So I've had to evolve, I guess. Yes. So make sure you follow Track All Summer on the thing, subscribe to our YouTube page, get a Track All Summer shirt or hat on our website, trackallsummer.com. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Coach Flo. I really appreciate you. Um, I love you so much. And with that being said, um, remember, no matter what time of the year it is, it's always a track of summer, baby. Oh, gosh. Coach Flo, I can't believe I've been crying on Beyonce's internet, on Allison Felix's ostrich fed to eat internet. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Coach Flo. Bye. See you guys later. Thank you.